Join our free WhatsApp group to get daily latest updates. It's totally free. The test is in four part, part one, part two, part three, and part four. Now listen carefully and answer questions one to ten. Last week, we looked at the traditional art of Japan. In this week's lecture, we're going to move south and look at the very special way in which art has developed in the beautiful island of Bali, which is now part of Indonesia. I'll begin by giving you a brief historical overview. It's thought that the first inhabitants of Bali were farmers who arrived around 3000 BC, at the beginning of the Iron Age. They probably originally came from China, and in Bali they cultivated rice and built temples ornamented with wood and stone carvings and statues. The Hindu religion was introduced in the 14th century AD, and this has remained the main religion on the island. This was an important period in the artistic development of the island, when sculptors, poets, priests and painters worked together in the service of the ruling families. Rather than painting everyday scenes, artists concentrated on narrative paintings illustrating the epic stories of Hinduism. Bali's rich natural resources have always made it an alluring goal for merchants, and from the 17th century onwards, Dutch ships visited the island to trade in spices and luxury goods. Gradually, the old royal families lost their power, and eventually, in 1906, the Dutch East Indies Company was founded, and the island became a colony. In the 20th century, art then took on a very different role, as a tool accessible to everyone in the fight of the Balinese people against colonization, rather than as the property of a minority. Shortly after this, in the 1920s, stories of the beauty of the island of Bali began to spread around the world, and Balinese art underwent another vast transformation with the advent of tourism to the island. At first, this was only on a small scale, but it had important effects. Expatriate artists from Holland and Germany settled on the island, bringing paper, Chinese ink and other new materials with them. They worked with local artists, encouraging them to experiment with concepts like naturalism, expressionism, light and perspective, as well as to move away from the traditional focus on narrative painting towards something closer to their own experience. When independence came in 1945, this desire for an art to match a new national identity became stronger and the traditional narrative paintings started to give way to scenes showing the everyday life of the Balinese people, harvests, market scenes and daily tasks, as well as the myths and legends of their history. Many of the features that give this art its special place in the world today can be traced back to these historical roots. One feature that is rooted in the events of the last century is that today in Bali the production and the appreciation of art is not restricted to a minority. 
In fact, there is a famous saying that in Bali, everyone is an artist. And it's not considered that to make art or talk about art, any formal training is needed. Art is just produced as part of Balinese life. Even fruit salad is served with flowers strewn on top. One factor which has contributed to this productivity is Bali's fertility. Over the centuries, the rich soil and the fact that food and shelter are readily available has given the islanders the leisure to develop their arts. While painting, sculpture, carving and music have traditionally been the province of men, women have channeled their creative energy into making lavish offerings to the gods with spectacular pyramids of flowers, fruit and cakes offered at the temples on festival days and celebrations. All these kinds of art still have close links with the religion of the people and are something that people do on a daily basis. Another special characteristic of art in Bali is that it is not generally seen as an individual pursuit. In the West, art is often carried out by the artist on his own, reflecting his own individual world view in the hope of achieving personal wealth and fame. For Balinese artists, art is something that's done as a group, and many artists may participate in one piece of work. And Balinese art is not restricted to temples and offerings. It decorates objects such as jackets, motorcycles, hotel menus and so on. But perhaps the most significant characteristic of Balinese art, and one that distinguishes it most from the art of the West, is to do with its expected lifespan. Carvings are made in soft stone, which is gradually destroyed over the years. The humid climate rots paper and cloth paintings. The magnificent offerings of fruit and sweets are eaten. Wooden statues are destroyed by insects. But Balinese artists accept that their work is ephemeral, not permanent, and instead of slavishly preserving the originals, they produce new art. And all this rebuilding, renovating and replacing means that the island's art continually evolves and perpetuates itself. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. You are going to hear a talk given by an international student. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now listen to the tape and answer the questions. As an international student coming from Sierra Leone, it gives me great honor to give these opening remarks and welcome you all to Ashisi University, where excellence is the code. I believe I speak on behalf of my fellow colleagues when I say we feel that we are the most fortunate and privileged university students in Ghana. You may ask, what is the basis of such a conclusion? And I will simply say to you, in which other tertiary institution in Ghana do you find the same level of IT infrastructure and facilities available to students? Where also do you find such a low ratio of students to lecturers and computers? In which other educational institution do you find 55% of students on some sort of financial aid who in addition enjoy services and benefits such as job placement after graduation, 
on-campus employment that pays above the minimum wage, a supply of textbooks, and access to online databases. Ladies and gentlemen, there is no other institution of higher education in Ghana today that matches the learning environment and the quality of instruction at Ashisi. I could continue listing reasons why we students feel this way, but I only have five minutes for this speech. Believe me, I could go on for hours. At Ashisi, everyone is considered a leader and is treated special. Ashisi equips us with the necessary determination, strength, and belief in ourselves to be able to achieve our goals. We are being taught to think outside the box and to question and challenge our assumptions about the world we live in. This, ladies and gentlemen, is one of the benefits of a liberal arts education, which seeks to broaden our intellectual capacity. Now look at questions 17 to 20. As the talk continues, answer questions 17 to 20. At Ashisi, we are also exposed to real-life situations and learn how to deal with them through a practical and vigorous academic program as well as various seminars in which prominent leaders in their professions are invited as guests to interact and share their knowledge and experiences. Some people, even some of you in this audience, may believe that tuition at Ashisi is too high, but I say to you that the students here are unanimous in saying it is worth it. Not because we all come from well-to-do families, but because when it comes to one's education, you need to aim at getting the best from the right place. One's education defines who you are and what your perception of life and society will become. Ashisi offers us a top-quality education which meets high international standards. This is due to the strong linkages the school has established with three of the very best schools in the United States, namely Swarthmore College, which is ranked as the best liberal arts school in the U.S., UC Berkeley, and the University of Washington. In addition, Ashisi has recruited an excellent faculty consisting of lecturers from various countries including Ghana, the UK, and the United States. These lecturers are among the best in their respective academic fields. I believe this is the school's greatest asset, a strong and knowledgeable team dedicated to achieving successful results from their students and who also love their job. I would like to end with a personal message. My fellow students, because we are among the most privileged in our society, we should take responsibility for our own destinies, make our parents proud, and create a legacy for those that follow us and Africa as a whole. We must give back to our society after completing school and achieving our goals in life, which I believe we all can if we properly utilize our time and take advantage of all that is offered here at Ashisi. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. You are going to hear a conversation between a student and a driving instructor. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen to the tape and answer questions 21 to 24. Hello, I'm going to be your driving instructor today. Are you ready to begin? Hi, hope you don't mind. It's my first time driving a car. Of course not. That's my job. I teach people like you how to become a safe and responsible driver. So let's begin. Remember, the most important rule of driving Safety first. There are some steps to follow. First, 
you should put on your seatbelt. You should always remember to do that. In case of an accident or emergency, having a seatbelt on is of utmost importance. Okay, I have my seatbelt on. Now what should I do? Start the car. Good. Now make sure that the steering wheel is in the proper position, and that your seat is not too far or not too close to the pedals. I'm all ready to go. Should I shift into first gear? Don't forget to put the parking brake down. You don't want to drive with that up. Oh yeah, I almost forgot. If I have the parking brake on, I won't be able to accelerate. Yes, that's right. Now put the car in reverse and slowly back out of the parking space. Good. Put the car in first gear. When should I shift? Is it better to shift slowly or quickly? You can shift whenever you feel is appropriate. This means shifting should occur smoothly. Do not shift too slowly, or you will stall. Shifting too fast will waste gas. Shifting is simple. Just remember to shift smoothly. To shift, you will have to push the clutch and then push the gas pedal. Now look at questions twenty-five to thirty. Now listen to the tape and answer questions twenty-five to thirty. Remember, smoothly is the key to good shifting. Like this. Yes, that's good. Now keep it slow. Don't drive very fast just yet. Be sure to constantly check your mirrors for oncoming traffic. Always be aware of everything that is around you, including three important things. Remember these three: people crossing the streets, other cars, and bicycles riding next to you. What should I do if I see a yellow light? Well. It's always better to brake instead of trying to run it. But if you're travelling at a speed where it's impossible to stop in time, then you should try to make it across the intersection. But remember, you should always try to stop. It's the safest way to avoid an accident. Even if I have to brake very suddenly? Yes, even if you have to brake suddenly. What about if a driver behind me is going a lot faster than I am? You should always be ready to move to a slower lane if a driver behind you is forcing you to go faster than you are comfortable with. Never try to speed up to accommodate a faster driver. You could risk an accident or a speeding ticket. It's better to let him go. That sounds like good advice. Be careful. There is a sharp turn up ahead. Remember to brake before turns. Otherwise, you might flip over if your speed is too high going into a turn. Got it. I know that I should always try to observe all traffic safety. That's right. If safety is not your first priority, it will make driving very dangerous for you and other drivers on the road. Okay, park the car here. You did a great job today for your first day. I'll see you in three days. Thanks so much. I will see you then. You now have thirty seconds to check your answers. Now turns to part four. You'll hear a man giving a lecture on nuclear fusion. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to thirty-three. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to thirty-three. 
I'd like to start by thanking so many of you for attending this, my first public lecture at this magnificent university. I'm going to be talking to you today about nuclear fusion. Before I proceed further, I would like to apologize on behalf of some of our newspapers for the sensationalist and hopelessly inaccurate articles that have been published on the subject over the years. I must confess that my own interest in the subject was actually stimulated by an article published more than 50 years ago in a popular Sunday tabloid with the impressive title Power from the Sea. Today, most people would probably interpret such a title as an introduction to a discussion on the latest developments in renewable energy sources, such as wave technology or generating electricity from tidal flows. But back then, little, if any, progress had been made in these fields since the invention of the water wheel. As I recall, following coverage of the opening of the world's first commercial nuclear power station more than 50 years ago now at Calder Hall in 1956, the article promised that we would have limitless, almost free electricity within 10 years. It claimed that we could do this using an isotope of water, deuterium, from the sea. This would be used in reactors to combine simple molecules of hydrogen to form helium, releasing energy in the process. Of course, this is different from the process of nuclear fission, which today's nuclear reactors use. I wouldn't like to say that the article I read as a boy was totally inaccurate. It's true that the concept of producing energy from nuclear fusion, essentially reproducing the reactions by which our sun and other stars produce energy, depends on fusing atoms of hydrogen, but the time scale suggested was hopelessly wrong. To this day, despite some very embarrassing false claims from scientists who should have known better, we have not been able to produce energy from nuclear fusion in a controllable way. Let me make clear what I mean by this statement, before some journalist in the audience gets hold of the wrong end of the stick. Yes, we have been able to fuse hydrogen atoms to produce helium and a release of energy, but the balance account has always been negative. We've always had to put more energy into the reaction than we've ever succeeded in getting out. We know the theory works but we still do not know if we can get fusion to work for us and solve the problem of our energy needs. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 34 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 34 to 40. Here, I will briefly explain these problems before going on to give you a summary of the innovative ways being tested to overcome them. First of all, we have to try to understand the incredible physical conditions that exist inside a natural nuclear fusion reactor such as the Sun. To start with, we have to create temperatures never experienced on our planet. Indeed, if we had experienced the temperatures required, then our planet would never have formed. We have to generate temperatures of at least 100 million degrees Celsius in a carefully controlled environment before we can even hope to produce a fusion reaction. The problems are immense, but it can be done. Many of you will know that you can put your hand into a very hot oven and not get burnt, provided you do not touch any of the surfaces. I won't go into the reasons for this phenomenon here, but we are applying roughly the same principles in designs for fusion reactors. I think I can promise you that the heat will be confined to a very small area. The other major problem we have to find a solution to is pressure. The pressures in a massive body like the Sun are vast, and this is what brings the hydrogen atoms into such close proximity to one another that they fuse into helium. 
We may not have to achieve the same pressures in a fusion reactor, but even so, it is a huge technological problem. What then makes me hopeful about the future of energy from nuclear fusion? Perhaps surprisingly, it is developments in laser technology. We can now use lasers to control the nuclear fuel pellets so that they remain suspended inside the reactor without touching the sides. Remember that these pellets are quite small, and because they contain atoms of deuterium and tritium, the two isotopic forms of hydrogen that can be used in these reactions, they are quite light. The lasers will also compress the fuel pellet to raise the pressure to that required to initiate the fusion reaction. Another, far more powerful laser will be used to heat the fuel pellet to the temperature required. This laser, if you like, will act as the trigger to start the reaction. Once started, it is hoped that the reaction will produce enough energy to maintain itself and also that it will produce a surplus in the form of heat that can be used to produce the steam needed to drive turbines in order to generate the electricity the world needs. To give you some idea of how much energy we can produce, it has been calculated that just one kilogram of fusion fuel is capable of producing the same amount of energy as 10,000 tons of fossil fuel. I think you would agree that such an objective is worth working towards. I believe, and I am not alone in this, that nuclear fusion could supply the world's energy needs for centuries to come. You now have half a minute to check your answers.